so I, I've spoken at uh, Elixir Sydney pretty often, and uh, apologies, I usually wind up talking about aviation and drones and simulation and these sorts of things. But this is my, uh, yeah, this is my uh, hobby, and uh, and uh, yeah, yeah uncrewed aerial vehicles and all this sort of stuff and drones and simulating them. So I'm just going to do this little talk. Um, um, this I, I, this hobby really got into. I really started getting into it in 2013. My friend Brian and I, um, and I'm, I'm going to go. Um, I'm going to go uh, uh, quite. Uh, that I've actually got a script for this because I prepared that for Yao. And because there's a lot of stuff, and because this is a favourite topic, and I can go off on tangents and stuff, I'm going to stick to the script for the um, slides part. And then we'll can, we can sort of slow down and actually show a lot more code and things like that when we get to the demo bit at the end. So I'm just going to go and present this bit straight through. I've already deviated, so here we go. Um, so since 2013, um, we got involved in this UAV challenge. Um, it's a competition run by the Q Queensland University of Technology and uh, CSIRO. And you get teams from all over the world and they have challenges such as dropping bottles of water for a lost bushwalker or returning a blood sample from a sick farmer or providing video and audio feeds of accident victims for an approaching medical team. And um, the competition actually takes place beyond line of sight, so we can't see the drone. It can like be up to you know 15 or so kilometres away. Um, and uh, that's a special thing that CASA lets, lets the drone people do. It's not common to, be, to let you do that in most um, countries where people have enough money to muck around with drones. So it's a great opportunity for everyone to really uh, test communications and try to control the drone when it's out of sight. Um, it's a huge amount of effort to get into this competition. I've had three attempts getting into the competition. Um, we um, actually, we started the Beam UAV um, team, which had involved Josh and some other people from Elixir Sydney. Um, to, we entered the 2020 20 competition. It's now put off till at least 22 due, due to uh, COVID. Um, but in the process, we've uh, broken lots of airplanes and written lots of code and built and things and had a lot of fun. Um, and my assumption is that some of you might be interested, if not in actually going into the UAV challenge, then at least in building and programming and flying UAVs or rovers or submarines or some of the other things that you can do with this technology. This is um, a programming group. So I assume you know a lot about programming and less about UAVs. The target at the end is to try and redress the gap. This is about a problem domain, mostly, like something different to web programming or other things that you might be doing at work. So I want to equip you with enough knowledge about UAVs to be able to go off and try something out. And that necessarily means that this uh, presentation is mostly going to be about UAVs just to fill in some context and some information. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the basics of how machines help to control vehicles and the kind of sensors you use, uh, the nature of and requirements arising from autonomy, um, vehicles running off by themselves, um, the hardware and communication things that we usually use, the programs we'll be writing, um, and what sort of programs Elixir in particular might be suitable for. And we'll finish up with this demonstration of using Elixir to uh, wire up this physical remote control, because you can still see my video, right? Hello? Is everyone on mute? Um, can yes, we can. Yeah, cool. Okay, yeah. So that, um, wiring up that to speak through a radio receiver to an old... Um, to an old um, an old autopilot, and then using that to control a software simulation of that plane that's behind me. Um, so a lot to cover, so let's uh, get through that. So first of all, talking about control, we'll talk about autonomy later on. Um, so direct human control. Um, aircraft basically started out as human carrying kites. So we had Lawrence Hargrave down at Stanwell Park, um, was one of the pioneers in that. And the Wright brothers used to fly their um, aircraft as kites. And a lot of the advances they actually got weren't to do with powered flight at all. They were actually about how to make aeroplanes work well. And they did a lot of that with kites. Um, and an aircraft's really just a kite with all the strings rerouted internally to a joystick and your rudder pedals um, so that the pilot can manipulate um, and control the aircraft. Um, when you go to remote control, um, as we know, we've got remote control toys of all sorts of descriptions, the pilots move back to the ground. The strings are still there. It's just that some of the strings are made up of radio waves. Um, so I just wanted to make that clear because we're not talking really about autonomy or anything like that yet. So this is all still a human in the loop controlling a vehicle. And the technology that's involved is basically just about communications. It's, um, we're not actually doing any sort of, uh, the computer, your software is not involved in actually doing anything other than just sending the position of a stick through to the aircraft. Um, so what happens if we want to start using the technology to start participating somehow in the control of the vehicle? For example, the pilot might be learning to fly 
and they need help to avoid over controlling or crashing or getting themselves into bad situations with the where they can't recover or what if the aircraft is just a kind of aircraft that's so difficult to control that even a trained pilot needs help to control it so i have a large radio controlled helicopter up there um, helicopters are quite difficult to fly because when you do one thing it causes two or three other things to happen at the same time and it took me about a year with a simulator and the control to actually get to the point where I felt like flying the real helicopter without uh, uh, chopping off my head with the rotor blades. Um, so, and yeah, it takes a lot of concentration. And so like pretty much all model helicopters these days, it has stability augmentation to reduce the uncommanded changes. Like it basically just do the things that the pilot tells you to do with the sticks. Um, and in this case on my helicopter, it's got this, uh, little box that sits between the radio receiver and the servos, which are the little motors like this thing that, um, that control the position of the rotor blades. Um, so to work all of this out, um, the software in the box has to know what the pilot wants to happen to be able to sense what's actually happening and then tweak the control outputs going to the servos and the engine to try and reduce the error between the two. So the first part, the pilot's intentions are already coming from the radio receiver. Um, and so we need to talk about the sensors and the control outputs to complete this picture. Okay, so quick view of the sensors. Magnetometers is a fancy word for a compass. They usually have uh, three little Hall effect sensors and they can detect the orientation of the Earth's magnetic field. Um, and uh, they can work out, you know, what direction the aircraft is pointing. Um, the direction that you're pointing is called the heading. Um, it's not necessarily the same as the direction you're going over the ground. That's called the track. And that can be because of wind or currents if you're in a boat, something like that. Um, and yeah, Hall effects, look them up. It's quite cool how Hall effect sensors work. Um, altimeter. Um, an altimeter or a barometer is measure, measuring the air pressure re relative to some reference pressure. Um, and uh, yeah, and so it's really just a measuring of the difference between two, two pressures. Um, you have for out measuring altitude, you have a reference pressure of what the air pressure is normally at at sea level. And then it's depending on how much pressure difference there is, the higher you go, the more um, that pressure is trying to push out against the surrounding thinner air, or the lower you go, the more the outside air is pressing in. And it has a little piezoelectric sensor to measure how much that pressure is in the airspeed sensor, which um, the reference pressure is just the ambient pressure around the aircraft. And you have a little tube that's pointing forwards um, and the other air gets rammed into that and you're looking at the difference in that forward pressure and the pressure that's just around the aircraft at that time and that's really important for control um, because that air pressure that's coming towards you is what makes the wings work and what makes the plane fly um, so it's really important for if you're controlling a, a vehicle to be able to know what your airspeed is rather than just your speed over the ground um, you have inertial measurement units imus um, and these are the same as what you have in your smartphone for, you know, measuring what's level um, and how fast it's rotating. Uh, most hobby UAVs use the same sensors that you'd find in a consumer grade electronics. Um, and they're measuring voltages in things are getting bent and twisted as the chip rotates and it can, you can actually measure the instantaneous speed of rotation or instantaneous acceleration um, using one of these chips. Um, and there are higher accuracy versions of these, which are used in spacecraft and full-size airliners and things. But for our purposes, as you've seen us at the moment, the cheapo ones are reasonably fine and affordable. Um, so these instantaneous accelerations, like at this moment, I'm being accelerated at 1G down into my chair. But these sort of instantaneous measurements aren't really useful in themselves. What you need to be able to do is you have to use a clock to measure uh, the acceleration at regular intervals. And then you keep running a total of all the acceleration um, and that should get you your current velocity. And then if you add up all your velocities over time, according to the clock, you wind up with a position estimate. And together with the magn magnetometer and these sorts of things, if you know where you started, you should be able to deduce by summing all of these things up. And this is called um, dead reckoning. Dead is short for deduced. It's not about uh, pirates or uh, death threats or anything like that. Um, so, um, yeah, and so you're basically just summing up all your accelerations over time to work out where you are at the moment. Um, how well does this work? Um, I was a uh, quick little anecdote. I was on a 747 going over to the US in the 90s. I was sitting next to a pilot and he invited me up to the cockpit um, to visit some of his friends. Um, and um, back in the days before 9-11, unfortunately, um, but it was very, very cool. Um, and um, there are the 747, um, they still have these just in case the GPS goes out. They have inertial reference sensors 
and they showed me they had these three little crosses on the on the navigation display we're somewhere out in the middle of the pacific near hawaii um and the three crosses were only spread out across about 10 miles or so um and they were initialized back in sydney so on an airliner they use laser ring gyros all these amazing imus and they're just summing up the change in position over time really quickly integrating it and uh, yeah, so even by the time you're getting close to Hawaii, starting in Sydney, um, the IMUs are still pretty accurate. Um, the consumer grade stuff that we use, um, it's a lot less accurate. Um, I read one estimate saying that only after about 20 seconds or so, your position could be out by more than say 10 meters if you're just trying to sum up with the, with the sort of accuracy that consumer grade stuff has. Um, so luckily we live in an age of GPS, and so we can get reliable position updates at a rate high enough, not as fast as the accelerometer, which is thousands of times a second, but a rate high enough to keep these summed up errors in check. Um, and there are other sensors like uh, LiDAR, I've got one of those over there, um, for laser distance measuring and motion flow, which is what you have in the bottom of a mouse to see how it's traveling over some scenery. Um, that can help you when you can't get a clear signal, like when you're indoors. Um, and this leaves us with a problem though, how best, we're getting lots of different estimates from different sensors all about what our position is. Um, so how do we combine all of these different sensors and their thoughts about where we are into one measurement? Um, this process is called sensor fusion. So um, there is an algorithm called the extended Kalman filter, and it's pretty much the de facto standard for how you fuse all of these things together. NASA worked on it in the 50s and 60s because it's exactly what you need for the space program. Um, and it's basically just all it's doing is, I, I mean, if you were thinking about how to do this, you might think of like a, um, a historical average of your position, like just blurring them all together. The only problem is that doesn't give you the position right now. And so basically what the EKF does is it gives you a near optimal estimate of the current vehicle state that's a mix of all your new measurements with all the history that you've built up about where you've been heading up to this point. And there's lots of YouTube videos and um, libraries, not actually in Elixir, there's a plain Kalman filter library in Elixir um, and explanations of how EKFs work. Um, you're probably not gonna write that yourself, but and I'll explain later why that's the case. So we've talked about the sensors. So now we know what the pilot wants to do and we know roughly where we are. Um, but the next thing we need to do is we need to discuss how do we close the gap between those two things. Um, so firstly, some terminology, the place we want to be or some value like your height or your X value or something like that, that's called the set point. That's the point that the person in control has set as um, where they want things to be. Under ideal circumstances, if you had direct control and you had perfect sensor fusion, the sensor feedback would just match it and it would be fine. But nothing, none of this is true. And in real life, it's a lot more like trying to steer a car or a boat for the first time. You're making a little change, um, you see what happens, and then you adjust your input um, in a continuous sort of feedback loop to learn how to control whatever, whatever it is that you're trying to control. And so there are a few strategies that you might use to do this. And the first one is, you could um, just, uh, depending on how big the error it is, the bigger the correction you make. So this, you know, so wow, it's a long way. We're really far off. Let's really hammer it. And this leads to sort of action movie style over control, particularly on a vehicle like a, a boat or a bus. Think of speed or something like that. Uh, something with a lot of inertia. Um, but if you dial in that proportion, so you, you, your response is proportional, you, you adjust the proportion, um, if you dial it in, it can work with a little bit of oscillation backwards and forwards. The second uh, sort of factor you could add on to that is uh, you, you have another you know, coefficient or a number that you, that you work out that's pro proportional to the rate of change of your error. So the steeper the curve, the faster the error is changing over time. Um, and so this is basically like brakes or a damping sort of effect. Like if you start really closing in on your target, it's like, whoa, whoa, slow, slow down, we're almost there. Um, and that can help the um, that can help it uh, slow down. Um, if if you make that too slow, if you make that factor too strong though, it can take a long time. Uh, it, it can really slow down how quickly you converge with the set point. And so if you have a hill here, and this is an altitude thing, and you're trying to sort of like smooth the altitude, you know, if you had that set really high, it might not pull up in enough time to make it over the hill. You know, you might have wanted to do that, but it's saying slow down, slow down, don't change the altitude, bump. Um, so that's what the proportional part of this is. Um, and then lastly, um, you can track over time whether you're consistently over or undershooting the result uh, and then introduce a little bit of a pressure to correct it. Like every time you notice you're low, 
it's like you hold a grudge. You sort of build up, a, you add on to an error and that error keeps getting bigger and bigger. I should make those arrows bigger as we go along because it's, uh, you know, it's saying, wow, we're still low, we're still low, we're still low. Like the longer that you go with an error, the more you try to correct it. Um, and examples of this might be, um, you know, the constant pressure that you're putting on, if you're pushing a pram on a sloping footpath and you're trying to push it one way and stop it from going onto the road because you love your children, um, or you are trying to control a lift um, and the lift's got a slightly stretched cable because it's old, it's perfectly otherwise okay, but because it's stretched, when you try to arrive at a floor, it's always a little bit out. And so it, it, um, it corrects it. You have to be careful with this last one um, because um, the sums can build up so that when the conditions suddenly change, it takes a while to realize that the cause of that error is no longer there. Um, so that's an example is the cruise control on our car. Um, and it tends to overspeed when it reaches the crest of a hill. Um, and it's been going up a hill for a long time, like some of those big hills near Marul and Goulburn or whatever coming up from Canberra. And as it crests the hill, it starts accelerating. Um, and it, so it starts overspeeding. Um, and that's a really good excuse if you're explaining something to the highway patrol about why you're going so fast down a hill. Um, uh, so there's a few other examples of that, which I'll skip. Um, so finally, you get you you mix these things together, and all we're saying is it's basically like the p factor times how big the error is times the d factor times how fast the error is changing, plus the i factor and how much the times whatever the sum is of your errors. That's that's all PID is, um, and that's um, these uh, three strategies come together to make a PID controller. And you use this in autopilots and cruise control, and air conditioners, lift motors, and pretty much anywhere where software is controlling some physical object. Because at software speeds, nothing is really instantaneous. Even like something that seems very immediate is still smoothed out when you're looking at it at software speeds. Um, tuning PIDs is a bit of a black art, but there are processes to follow and usually start off mainly with P. Um, and then you add a bit of D to slow things down. And then you use I very, very sparingly if you've got some sort of long uh, pro long error that's building up. Um, so the rate that this runs at, notice the time going across there. Um, my, that's to show, indicate that we're doing it very, very frequently. Um, the same rate at which this loop runs is really critical. And generally the faster, the better. If you have that same perfect PID controller and it was running too slowly, it's like trying to fly by a, by a correspondence. You know, dear UAV, please turn 20 degrees. I refer to my little dated blah, blah, blah. Um, it's just too slow um, and too much stuff is happening. Um, and I actually know of some companies that designed uh, UAVs where the companies basically got in massive trouble because they weren't running. They hadn't left enough processing time to actually do this fast enough for the sort of vehicle they were controlling. Um, so yeah, the required speed differs depending on how stable or twitchy the thing is that you're trying to control. Um, most aircraft are designed to be naturally stable and they have a fair bit of inertia and damping. And this makes them easy to fly. You take the hands off the controls and they generally keep going if, um, if, they're, um, if they're trimmed out. Um, you only need to nudge controls occasionally to make it uh, change direction. Uh, as the aircraft becomes smaller and optimized for maneuverability, say a Red Bull racer, very twitchy and fast, um, it's less and less the case. However, usually 20 to 30 hertz of running this sense, you know, run your EKF, run your PID control loop, Run it at, running at 20 to 30 hertz would be enough uh, for, you know, for a full-size plane. Um, when maneuverability becomes a matter of life and death, um, your fly-by-wire controls like you have on fighter jets um, allow them to, you to actually design the jet to be unstable from the start. This allows them to maneuver very quickly, and they're only controllable with stability augmentation like the, like the box that I have on my helicopter. Um, and I remember that the F-16, which is uh, the picture here, is uh, it's with about 50 hertz. It was a fighter designed in the 70s. And so that 50 hertz was sort of enough to control a deliberately unstable fighter. When we get down to models, um, they're by just virtue of their small size, they get less stable. Um, and uh, I know that uh, when I use these old Arduino-based um, Arduino auto autopilots, they um, used to run at about 60 hertz. Um, they're just like, it's just like a little, um, whatever it's, um, I've forgotten the name of the processor that's in that, but it's not much. Um, when you get to uh, helicopters, um, 60, I remember, was right at the bottom end of the range of viability because they need a lot more control, they're a lot more twitchy. Um, and I remember that these were, like, I mean, I, um, the helicopter version of the autopilot was uh, always sort of a bit of a marginal thing until the higher powered um, sort of hardware came along. Um, when you get to um, a drone, these are actually very, very twitchy to control. 
Um, and um, they're typically running at about 400 hertz is a typical sort of sensor, sensor PID loop speed. Um, and it should be clear that by this point, you know, we're really talking about real time computing because that means you've only got two and a half milliseconds for every site, for every loop to get all of that stuff done. Um, so yeah, just another last little thing about PIDs is it's not, uh, most PID, PIDs aren't directly controlling the thing that we're measuring. For example, if we want our PID to fly at a particular, we want our UAV to fly at a particular altitude, it's not like the whole UAV is on the end of a big arm that's, um, that's my, on an end of a big arm tied, you know, directly controlled by the servo. Um, what actually happens um, is that you've got a cascade of PID controllers. Um, and uh, yeah, and the servo itself is like, you can actually see it here. There's a little wire here. And that's connected to this elevator, which is a, a control surface at the back, which controls how the aircraft pitches up and down. Um, and so that means that the first PID is uh, trying to fix the altitude using the rate of climb. The second PID is trying to fix the rate of climb with the pitch angle. The third PID tries to fix pitch angle with the rate that the pitch angle is changing. The final PID tries to fix the pitch angle change of change rates using the elevator position. And then the servo itself um, has a little sensor that measures its current arm position and engages the motor to wind one way or another to match the set point. So it's at a little sort of hardware sensor PID loop in its own right is in the, in the box. So that's the basic introduction to sensing and controlling vehicles. And I thought that was quite important just to talk about because it's common to all of this. You probably not have to program this stuff yourself, but it explains a cool bit of technology that lets tiny, tiny camera drones sort of hover like they're nailed to the sky. And SpaceX boosters, um, do, like a serial number 15 was pretty awesome last week, but you know, being able to nail those landings from space, this is what they're doing. They're using the sensor fusion and PID control loops to, fight, to change the angles of the rockets and to decide when to fire the rockets. Um, and it also, but it's really, the really important thing is if you're gonna muck around with this stuff, especially avia aircraft things, um, is it highlights the safety critical nature of the PIDs and tuning them, which you will be doing. If you if you might not be programming it, but you'd definitely be setting the parameters for PID or having to go through the tuning process, and you have to give them uh, computing resources so that they can run in real time, and that's really important. So that's uh, where I was. Uh, yeah, that's why it was important to talk about these things. So now we can get on to talking about autonomy, and so it's about autonomy is basically what happens when a human's left the control loop. Um, so there's still control in autonomy, but it's set up before the flight. Well, and there's a sort of a blurry line between the design process um, and, and issuing autonomous commands. It becomes a bit clearer if you've got some sort of timer, you know, there's a, some type, sort of time-based trigger. So for example, there are these the free flight models, which are non-radio controlled models that used to be very popular and still, you know, anyway, rabbit hole. Um, uh, there are clockwork timers and what you do is you send, you, you send your guider up and then it's got a little timer where after a bit of time it pops the elevator up and it causes the plane to come down steeply and land without hopefully damaging itself. So that's, you know, a timer goes off and um, that's the basic sort of autonomy. Um, you can have the same sorts of sensor stuff, the same sorts of control loops that we've just been talking about can be used with a set point that sticks before launch, like head in this direction for this much time. Um, or you, the set points can vary according to a timer or advance as the next navigation waypoint on a flight plan is established, uh, a flight plan that you establish before takeoff is reached, go this direction and then go this direction and go this direction with some sort of timer to make it click over. Um, and um, set points can also be updated continuously from a recording like the Boston robot dance moves. Um, um, or because the recording is of this is the position I wanna be and then Boston Robotics is doing all of the PID uh, sensor fusion stuff to actually try to get the robot into that position for the dance. Um, uh, or the, um, the, the ground scanning radars, radars, which are used by modern cruise missiles that can navigate without reference to GPS. They just look at the contours of the ground and they know where they are. Um, and so just at that point, I should, since we're talking about autonomy and I seem to have struggled to, uh, over the last few slides, to find some more pleasant use cases, we might just quickly address the elephant in the room about autonomy which is, is autonomy evil? Um, a landmine is a pretty horrible weapon um, and it's considered to be one of the most awful weapons that people have ever invented. What if we used a camera and computer vision classifier sensor so that the mine was only detonated by a person wearing a military uniform, is that more or less evil? What if they had to be armed? 
um, before we before the landmine went off? Or what if the we use face recognition to target a specific list of people? So, and I'll just say, I'm definitely not making the uh, guns don't kill people argument. That's a stupid argument. But I'm just more cautioning against falling into the Terminator tropes every time, um, allowing a little more room for nuance every time you're on the comment section of a Boston Dynamics robot video. Um, of course, this is all about military stuff. In civilian life, uh, we don't want to kill, maim, or even mildly inconvenience anyone. This is the fundamental requirement of autonomy when we're working with UAVs, particularly flying ones. And it's the vast bulk of autonomous behavior in UAVs. It's designed to mitigate this sort of thing. Taking photos and delivering packages are sort of like a very distant second, uh, you know, lower responsibility than not hitting someone. Um, the, and the, you know, uh, this is, you know, I, I suppose I would, if you paid me a bit, I would let someone fly this into me, but, uh, but not that thing behind me. Um, so, you know, the danger is quite real. Um, the 2014 Outback Challenge was at Kingaroy. Um, the UAV behind me, in that when it was configured for that, weighed 26 kilograms. It carried five liters of petrol. And someone pull me up on this if it's wrong, but I surprisingly, five liters of petrol has the same energy content as 170 kilograms of TNT. Um, so from the competition location at Kingaroy, it could have reached the Sunshine Coast or the outskirts of Brisbane. Um, and you know, there's lots of people, lots of inflammable bushland there. And you know, model helicopters have killed people when they, you know, when they hit them. There's big spinning carbon fiber blades, and they're sort of a lot more powerful than your average lawnmower. So just think of a lawnmower lying on its back with the blade spinning at full RPM, and you know, you know, even a two kilogram drone could could injure someone just by falling on them. Oh yeah, and that's the build that I forgot, which is a picture of our um, five liter fuel tank. Um, so what are the ways that what are the specific ways that our mission could go pear shaped? Uh, we could lose our ground station or communication link with the aircraft. Uh, we could lose a GPS signal or, or our altimeter and become uncertain of where we were. We could have a blocked airspeed pitot tube or an IMU fat failure or a badly tuned PID and lose control of the aircraft. Uh, we could find ourselves in conflict with other air traffic, lose an engine or an electrical bus, or one of our lithium polymer batteries could catch fire, which they tend to do. Um, some risks such as prop strikes when, you know, this is by the way, That's the, that's the propeller of this plane. That's a spare one. So we have to hand prop this and that's made of carbon fiber and it's quite sharp. So, sorry, that's just, that's one of those rabbit holes I was talking about. Um, so, you know, some risks like, like getting your finger chopped off by a prop are addressable with the team procedures and the checklist, but after takeoff, it's we're relying on our software and hardware um, to basically save the day. So the best way to protect people from a UAV is to fly it somewhere where they are not. Uh, just one reason urban delivery drones are a bad idea. Um, a geofence like the one shown here from the 2014 challenge at Kingaroy is a boundary that's set before launch that contains the entire flight plan. Geofences are separated into hard and soft varieties. A soft geofence might trigger a return to base or a turn back towards the main volume of the area, um, assuming that there's perhaps there's a strong wind or there's an error in the flight plan and the operators can have time to issue new instructions uh, to return to base or whatever they want to do. Um, a hard geofence enclosing the soft geofence, maybe a few, 100 metres or two further out, um, it will trigger the flight termination system, which is based on the assumption that whatever was supposed to happen at the soft geofence hasn't worked, and the risk to people and property inside the geofence of a UAV planting itself into the ground is lower than the risk outside. Um, for the competition, notices are published to the, uh, to the pilot briefing systems that all the airline pilots and, and private pilots have access to, warning about the UAVs, and residents have given permission for the uh, UAVs to fly over their properties. Um, also, just if you look down at the bottom where this, this, the team tent was set up down here and it was the geofence was deliberately very close to the tent so that as part of the qualification, teams would have to actually pick up their whole vehicle and carry it over the geofence so that the judges could see that the flight termination triggered without destroying the plane, like it would, it would uh, try to crash itself. Um, this is actually a picture. I wish I could find the video of this because I'm screaming a lot as it happens. Um, it's an unscheduled reboot of one of these uh, when we were doing some testing of that plane back there. Um, flight termination can be triggered for other reasons other than a geofence breach, for example, a failure of the GPS signal. Um, and we know that our fused position estimate is going to be unus unusable within 30 seconds or so. Um, termination sends, means you set set points direct directly to the servos to cut the engines on a helicopter or initiate a spin which is like this uh, on a uh, fixed wing aircraft. 
and a spinning is better than a dive because uh, the, the flight path still is vertical, so you're not going to drift outside the geofence. Um, but the speed is lower and it's less likely to cause an injury or an impact fire when it hits the ground. Um, yeah, so that was uh, that. Was that. Um, then you can have, um, we'll move over into dynamic flight planning, which is another sort of thing that we can do to stop things going wrong. In the case of a communications failure, for example, the UAV is still flyable, but the mission priority shifts to re-establishing communications. So this means reducing the distance to the ground station, the most simple options to skip to a point in the flight plan where the aircraft returns to close to launch and orbits nearby, um, and eventually followed by either they regain uh, signal or there's a flight termination, flight termination system um, goes off. Okay, so that's, and that would just be literally like a go-to in your flight plan. Oh, we've lost comms, so let's just go over here to step 79 or whatever, and which involves heading back towards where the radio transmitter is and seeing if we can re-establish contact. Um, in the most recent competitions, there's been an extension challenge to autonomously avoid simulated moving flocks of birds, bad weather, and aircraft transiting the airspace while continuing the mission and not breaching the geofence. So this involves all the forward planning, projection of flight paths, battles of priority with all sorts of nasty edge cases uh, to test. Um, and it's hard enough with these challenges, let alone cars to children or dogs, which is why the uh, urban delivery is such a really dodgy idea. Um, and yet this sort of autonomy and this sort of flight planning is really interesting as a problem. And it's right at the cutting edge of what all the hobbyists and the academic and commercial research is, is uh, working on, is how to basically provide them with enough intelligence to sensibly plan to avoid, uh, avoid uh, collisions or, or danger. Um, C is an, another one of those things we do to mitigate danger. So I'll, because I'm about to show a whole lot of hardware, I'll quickly um, go through some of these things and just explain what they are, because especially if you haven't worked with microcontroller stuff before, some of these things will be new. Um, okay, so first of all, we have um, the, that's a radio receiver um, they, and, a, uh, and a radio transmitter, and they work on the same 2.4 gigahertz range as your Wi-Fi does. Um, this is a radio modem with an omnidirectional antenna. Um, it's uh, depending on the distance and the gain, a pair of radio, radio modems can uh, provide a serial link from the USB port of your computer uh, to your UAV. Um, this particular UAV um, radio modem is Australian design, it's very cool up in Queensland. Um, and it uses a class license where you don't need to get an extra license or whatever to use it. It's a um, 920 megahertz range for radio ham people. Um, this is um, an original Arduino-based um, ArduPilot microcontroller. Um, and here, this is a more recent uh, Raspberry Pi-based, um, sorry, I'm distracting myself by doing that, uh, ArduPilot with a little shield on top. So that thing on top is something you buy separately. That's to protect the barometer because it's sensitive to light. Um, and uh, it's a hat that's plugged in on top and it's got all our IMUs and accelerometers and GPS, there's a GPS aerial, um, and connections for all the other modems and sensors and things like that. Um, there's, um, oh, there's a few other things. There's a, that's an engine ignition control switch, which allows us to turn off the, turn off the um, engine without having to approach the aircraft. Uh, that's uh, LIDAR I was talking about earlier, um, which is uses laser to measure height, which we really need if you're trying to land a plane like that, because you don't really know where the ground is until you can look at, use one of those to see it's this many meters away. And that's a um, that's voltage controller um, to distribute power out of your electronics. And that's a servo, which I already showed you earlier. Um, in uh, 2014, uh, we had, five separate computers. There were three autopilots, a companion computer that did the computer vision and a fail-safe Arduino over on the other side. Uh, the fail-safe had to have an independent power source and ran a state machine that monitored all the autopilots and the communications and controlled which of the autopilots for the RC receiver got to control the servos. Um, and if the answer was none of them, it would trigger a flight termination itself. Um, this is the current state of the avionics. This is a picture of what it looks like inside the plane behind me a bit of a big weight loss program. There's only two computers now. There's the um, Raspberry Pi at the front, which can actually run Beam um, on, uh, on, on uh, Linux along with the, uh, along with ArduPilot and the same old, um, uh, the same old uh, fail safe controller at the back with some extra electronics that Brian designed, which is very clever. Um, this is basically all the stuff that decides these wires are all who gets to control which, you know, who, which one of these receivers or the autopilot gets to control the actual, um, 
the actual servos in the plane. Um, and um, yeah, and the failsafe is responsible for the fail. I'll, I won't go too much into the details, but the main, um, I suppose, um, I'll, I'll just talk about this. Um, the other thing that we've changed since 2014 is since nothing can happen if the servos aren't powered, uh, we've split all the servos across two separate battery systems so that there's always about half of the controls are still there if one of the battery systems fails. Um, and just the takeaway from all of this stuff about hardware um, is that it forces UAV software to be very distributed. And we haven't even talked about the ground station yet. So distribution is really critical and it maybe sounds familiar to, you know, uh, elixir people as, you know, maybe that's something that Elixir might be quite good at. Um, speaking of distribution, we'll just quickly talk about um, the um, communications. Um, now we've got 20. Oh, we're about, this is about, oh, 35, really? Damn it. Um, okay. I'll just go a bit faster on this. Basically, um, if you go and look at, if you look at this, um, that you can have direct voltages, you can have basically switching things on and off through the GPIO. Pulse width modulation is what you use to um, the radio receiver talks. That's how you talk to servos and how you talk to receivers. Um, and it's sort of like just setting positions of, um, of servos. Um, I2C is for using for talking to little devices and for everything else we use serial. Uh, which is just which is starting to get into normal programming, and we use a lot of serial and new art uh, type communications. And of course, um, yeah, there's lots of drivers and things for all of these things. But if you're new to microcontrollers, just knowing where you use the different sorts of communications can help uh, clarify things a lot. Uh, up into software, um, so we'll talk about Mavlink in a second, but it's a um, it, because we're going to be looking working with it in um, Elixir, um, but it's a uh, it's a, a protocol for publishing and subscribing uh, to data and sending commands between uh, UAVs and ground stations and components on the UAVs. Um, it's really lightweight, um, really low, only bytes, a few bytes of overhead. It can address up to 255 different systems over really noisy high latency networks. Um, and it has two layers of checksums because it really is assuming that something is going to get mangled as it travels over radio modems or whatever. Um, there are messages are defined in these XML dialect files. Um, there's, you can actually get uh, PyMavLink is a project from RG Pilot that can generate uh, generate clients uh, for a particular MavLink dialect in lots of different languages, C and JavaScript and Lua and Objective C and Swift and a whole lot of other things. Um, and I've written my MavLink uh, project, which you can get on uh, Hex, which uh, will generate a client for you um, on Elixir. Um, RG Pilot, um, you've got, uh, you've got, uh, it, it, RG Pilot works, I'm just trying to go faster here because I'm, I'm going over time. Uh, it, uh, you can, you, you have, um, you can control not just aircraft, you can do helicopters, you can do submarines, you can do boats, um, you can do rovers. If you just probably, if you're not interested in flying, but you still want to kind of golf and do something funny, then uh, you can have a little rover that runs around. Um, and, um, and it's quite uh, nicely written. It's got this thing called the hardware abstraction layer, which lets it run on lots of different software. Um, and one of the most useful ones for me is there's one called SITL or software in the loop, which lets me run, a, just basically go and run RG Pilot on my computer here um, as in a simulation and hook it up to flight simulators and things to see what happens. Um, ground stations. Uh, a ground station, you know, provides a user interface for the UAV operators um, to configure a vehicle and plan a mission and arm and launch the UAV and then monitor the project pro, um, pro, um, progress. And you might be able to press a button to cause it to orbit um, or, um, or, you know, set, make it hop and go to a different spot in the mission plan. Um, there are three ground stations from RG Pilot. There's Mav Proxy, which is a command line thing written in Python. Um, there's APM Planner, which is uh, an, which is for our desktop thing for Mac and Windows, and there is Mission Planner, which is only for Windows. Um, so finally, some Elixir code, and I'm sorry that's actually further taken time longer longer than I thought. Um, so um, okay, okay. So basically, I'll, to summarize this, you can use Elixir to do um, PID. Um, type controllers, and I actually demoed this a, a year or so back at Sydney when I was doing that X-plane simulation, and I was controlling a plane in X-plane um, uh, via this Elixir code. 
Um, but basically, it's in summary, it's I don't think this is really the best place to be using Elixir because you're talking about multi-processing and processes can get swapped out. And the last thing you want to be swapping out is a PID control loop because if you swap it out too much, the aircraft or whatever can become uncontrollable. Okay, because you know how important it is for us to be able to process things quickly. So I think that this sort of code is probably better in C or Rust or some sort of low level thing. It's literally a driver driving the vehicle. Um, and it's important for it to be as real time as possible. That said, I did find an interesting thing. A Japanese guy was um, talking about how to use Elixir for an Erlang for real time stuff and what sort of settings you could you could use. But still, I, I don't think it's necessarily the strongest point for Elixir. And the thing about that simulation was that was for a full-sized aircraft in the simulator. And so it really only needed 20 to 30 hertz to be able to be controllable. Um, I think the place where Elixir is really going to be strong at is some of that higher level planning. You basically want to be able to like set off some background planning tasks to be able to dodge that flock of birds or decide how you're going to plan something. In the meantime, the plane flies along on whatever the most recent flight plan was that you gave it. But every now and then you get a better option and say, okay, here's a new flight plan. And I think this sort of uh, soft, soft real-time stuff is actually, that's like I said before, that's where all the research is happening. And I think that's somewhere where Elixir is really strong. It might be even more interesting with NX and the ability to, um, and the ability to run neural networks and those sorts of things there. This is a, could be a really sweet sort of uh, domain for Elixir to be in. Um, so existing ground station software, I've been struggling with the one I'm using in this presentation. Um, for instance, if you put it into, it's a desktop application, you put it as a background window and all of a sudden it stops working because for some reason it doesn't have focus and it doesn't, that's the last thing you want for a ground station. Um, so I think, you know, ideal ground stations, think more of like your SpaceX mission control. You'd run it as a cluster. Individual cluster members could have their own radio modems plugged into the USB ports for redundant connections to the planes. Um, and uh, you could have uh, distributed consensus and failover and all that sort of stuff and use Phoenix Live View, which is absolutely perfect uh, for these sorts of uh, shared, uh, you know, these sorts of shared uh, user interfaces. You could basically just have a whole cluster of ground stations and people could log in and one of them could catch fire and everyone would just transparently swap over onto the other one and keep going. Um, Josh Price wrote a flight simulator for, um, got runner up in the Phoenix Frenzy in 2019. And so Josh is part of Beam UAV and we're hoping to marry this stuff up with some of the stuff I'm about to show you uh, to make a really rock solid um, ground station. It would be pretty awesome. And I think really address some of the problems that people have been stuck with the ground stations. Um, communications. So uh, the binary, all the binary wrangling that Elixir can do, um, the dialyzer type checking, I definitely, you know, I care about type checking with this sort of stuff, but I just do it at compile time, not at runtime. Um, if it's not, doesn't necessarily make it super easy to work with Mavlink, but it certainly makes it very low boilerplate and seems to be really well suited to working, doing this sort of communication stuff. I mean, Erlang was built for communications, you know, running telephone exchanges and these sorts of things. Um, so the Elixir Mavlink application, it's got a code generator that uh, uh, converts Mavlink XML files into this sort of X Elixir code. It makes a module which has got all of the different messages and things com um, combined in it. And it also it comes with a supervised, fully supervised application that lets you code speak to any Mavlink device over serial UDP or TCP uh, connections. And, it's, and, you know, and it, it's, it's supervised, so it tends to restart and you know, no matter what happens. Um, so, unfortunately, I've pretty much used up, that's the time I was going to use for the entire, uh, for the simulation and the talk. Um, so, yeah, I'm about 15 minutes over what the recorded talk is with all my ums and my very small, um, with my very small rabbit holes that I've done. Um, but I really thought it was important to do that other stuff because without it, I would have just been spouting a whole load of um, acronyms by this point and you wouldn't uh, have uh, any... Um, you, know, you wouldn't have any uh, baseline or know what we what what, what I was what the dem problem domain was that we were trying to deal with. Um, so um, I understand that people need to go, but if people are anyone who wants to, and that's you know perfectly okay because it is uh, late. But if you're interested, so I have a um, hardware simulation of our UAV in X plane, which is a flight simulator. Um, the uh, Argy pilot, the Sittle Argy pilot, provides a way for me to connect Argy plane into X plane. Um, but I want to control the uh, simulation from my radio transmitter. So what I'm going to do is I'll plug in my radio receiver 
into um, one of my old RG pilots um, and it'll decode the PWM signals. Um, and then we'll use Elixir to forward all of those uh, positions of the control sticks into the simulation. So let's see if that uh, is going to work. And uh, okay, so if I go like this, oh, by the way, that's the clipping. <laughs> I will, um, not, no questions yet, but I do have some links there. And so at least they're on the screen for a bit for the recording, but I'll go and do the demo now. If, um, uh, okay, let's see. Okay, so this is APM Planner. Um, that's the ground station software. I'm keeping it open because it's got a cute map. And also there's one command I haven't been able to write in Elixir I need to do this demo. Um, here is X-Plane and that's the same. This is Dalby Airport in Queensland. And if we zoom in, there's the simulation. X-Plane's fantastic because it lets you actually build the planes as you, um, you know, you, you actually lets you do quite realistic simulations of planes. And uh, so I'll just, uh, there we go into the, current stand over here. Um, so, okay, so we've got the simulation. So now what we need to do is first, um, hopefully all of this is going to work. Um, the first thing I'll do is this is some, um, so I've downloaded um, a build of RG plane. I'm using a slightly old one at the moment. Um, um, I'm, I'm telling it, I've, this is just C, a C program. I use, you know, C make and make and I compile it. I tell it um, you're going to be the plane is going to be provided for you by X plane. X plane is listening on this IP address, um, and that HAL abstraction, the hardware abstraction layer, we want to be able to simulate um, a radio receiver plugged in to this vir virtual autopilot. So um, the HAL for SITL provides a way a, a UDP port where we can actually shove shovel um, uh, RC inputs uh, into uh, into the plane. So I'll just start up. This is plane starting. Okay, it's sitting there. Um, we are, um, okay, next I'm going to, what's the best way to do this? I'll, I'll just start, this is, uh, so what I'm trying to do is, I, I mentioned before Mav proxy is a command line, um, a, a command line ground station. Uh, and, and I'll just get the, the model, the model here in your head is that you've got the ground station software, that desktop software, you've got the plane simulator, and you've got this, uh, it's plugged in over there. I can't move the camera, but we've got one of those plugged into a receiver over there. Um, so there are these three different systems that are all going to be talking Mavlink and the, um, and the uh, Elixir code, the Elixir application is going to sit in the middle of all of those acting as a router. Okay. Um, and I'll just, maybe that's a good point. I'll just show you the, I'll show you just the config for how this is set up. Um, Basically, this is this is a project called Mavlink Util that I'm working on right at the moment. I was checking stuff in earlier today. Um, the um, and it's got a dependency on Mavlink, which is that um, which is that application that I um, I was talking to about earlier. That's uh, that's up on Hex. Okay, so Mavlink's acting as our router. It's just like having a, a network router over there. And I've got an, I'm building a new application wrapping that, which can basically go and address different um, different vehicles and systems through the router. Um, so I just introduce that as a dependency. And then when I configure this thing, um, all I need to do is to say, okay, Mavlink, um, I'm gonna use, um, I want the dialect, the dialect you're gonna be speaking, the definition of um, the, the message definitions and the enumerations and all of that stuff are gonna be in this module called APM. This is APM over here. Um, it's uh, thousands of lines of, um, I actually, I'm of course insanely proud of it, but I don't really have time to show, show it to you, but that's all generated. That's um, a mixed task where you just give it the XML files and it goes and generates this file. And then once I've got that file, I just refer to it from here saying, Mavlink, you're gonna be speaking this dialect. Here are some connections. So the analogous, these are analogous to ethernet cables. There's gonna be a TCP connection to Arduplane. Um, there's gonna be a serial connection to this thing that's over there. Um, and there's gonna be a UDP connection to um, APM Planner, that other ground station with the, with the map and stuff going on. So this, when we configure this app, when this application turns on, it's just like plugging in three ethernet cables to, a back, to the back of, um, of a router except we're going to be sending Mavlink messages to systems um, on Mavlink. And they can forward, like Mavlink, can, you can have things like you can have a, 
a mothership and they can have a little helicopter on the back of it and the helicopter takes off and lands and it relays communication from the helicopter to the ship and then back to a ground station. Mavlink can, is designed to do that sort of routing uh, behavior. So here we start this up. Okay, so I'll just make that a bit bigger so we can see. System mode change to initializing for system one. That's the station. Of course, we could do that ourselves with say, but the ground station's just mode change to initializing for system two. So it's basically just listening to the application. It's saying, oh, there's vehicle 1.1. That's the simulation. Vehicle 2.1, that's the thing that we're going to pick up our radio control stuff from. And um, it goes off and it loads all the parameters for these things, which are um, there we go. There's like there's hundreds of like global. There's a big list of global variables for all the different settings, like our PID. Mode change, mode change to auto for system two. So um, I we won't regain to system two hundred and fifty-two after seven thousand and sixty-eight seconds. Because I turned it off for the presentation. Um, okay. So so what I'll do. So I'll, I think I, because we're late, I'll just basically show you flying the plane. And then afterwards, if people want to ask questions, I can show you how individual commands worked. We're basically in IEX. Um, and I, when um, in my IEXEXS script, my loading script, I've just imported a whole word. No, not there. Uh, IEXEXS. I've just imported a whole, I've got lots of little different libraries that give me commands that I can type at the command line in IEX for managing which, you know, for arming an aircraft, for, de for deciding which um, aircraft I'm wanting to work with at the moment changing flying modes and requesting parameters and setting parameters and also forwarding radio control which is what we want to do here um, i want to forward the radio control messages and uh there's all the different sorts of um message names from this dialect of mavlink that we might be able to that our code could use with link loss to system 252 that's the ground station complaining because it's in the background that's what i was talking about unreliable ground stations so we'll go focus on vehicle Leave two. To system 252 after 10 seconds. So this is uh, this is where we're going to get our radio control from. So I've set the focus to there. I can talk. I talked to some people before the meeting about my problems that I'm having with the prompt um, in IEX and why it's not perfect. But now it's at least saying me. I'm talking to vehicle two. Link lost to system um, And I'll say uh, focus. Oh, so now I say forward link regain to system 252 after 13 seconds forward radio control i'm just going to run a function um and you can see i'll, I'll bring this up this is the um that's rg plane running if i start running this it's gonna first of all i better turn on that i'll turn that on okay so we've got radio control there and i start forwarding the radio control and now you can see that basically 18 frames a second we're sending these um things up and if i um What's what's uh what's one of these ninety? Oh yeah, look at column one. No change to stabilize the system. Look one. at column one, and you can see that that's my aileron control rolling the plane. You can see the value is changing there as I change the as I change the joystick. Um, so we've got that. Um, this I'm really struggling with the uh, number of. So I suspect the system is not the plane is not armed. So we'll say focus on vehicle one. I'll say arm. Um, vehicle one is armed. I want it to say red. This vehicle is armed. It Link could... lost to system two hundred and fifty-two. Um, let's just see that. Explain. I'll oh, explain this pause. That might explain some things. There you go. Sound effects. It doesn't really sound like that. It sounds like a deranged lawnmower. Um, and um, okay, so here we are. So are we... system one is armed. Okay, we've got we've got that. We've got the brakes on. One of the things that gets me all the time. No, the brakes are off. I think. Okay. Link regain to system 252 after 16 seconds. Okay, so I'll just, I will just see what mode this is in, um, because I want to demonstrate something called, I want to demonstrate that that augmented control. It's actually in that uh, uh, cancel, whatever that is. Cancel, no, cancel, whatever you're doing. Um, armed stabilize, this is stabilize mode. So this is going to have, this is actually going to make it easier for me to fly. It's going to, it's on the controls with me and I have to do a lot less than I'd normally do to keep the plane stable and flying in the direction that I want it to go. Um, which is, so it's demonstrating the PID control stuff that I talked about at the start of the presentation. So we'll do a quick circuit. So I'm, I'll, I'll try to show you the, um, 
to show you um, the first verisimilitude. I'm controlling it with the joystick. But what's happening is like when I release the joystick, it levels the wings. So that's the um, PID control loop that in effect. It's, you can see on the screen, it's incredibly hard to tell which plane, way the plane is up. Um, so it's actually much easier for me to do this. And if I, when I'm normally on my three screens here, I can actually see, um, we're gonna be a bit high there. I can actually see where we are on the map. You can see just down there on the corner of the map that it's, um, that it's coming into that area. Uh, this could be very, I'm gonna turn around just while I do the landing because, uh, but just remember while we're doing this, there are a whole lot of messages whizzing through Elixir. This is way too high, okay. Um, oh well, I won't bother, I won't bother making you watch me redo this landing. Um, Set of professional audio. What? There you go. That was supposed to be a landing, but I was a bit, actually let's do it. way and let's not go into the ground. There's a lot of very expensive simulated airplanes over there, so. Okay. Sorry, I made you loop, and I said I wouldn't do that, and it's just. It's much harder to do this when people are watching. You really just want to see you crash, Robin. Yeah, I know. I know. Sorry. Sorry to disappoint. <laughs> there you go. So just remember, all of that was flying around with little Elix Elixir messages were basically... Remember that Elixir, you can use it for audio streaming and stuff. It's not just, you know, you know it's not just like web, web request type speed stuff you can do. You can do stuff that's animation speed for this sort of thing. Um, so at that point, um, I'll put that on pause. I'm happy to show you any of the code. I realize this is very late and thank you all for st sticking around. I can answer questions. I can poke into the code and show you how some of these, um, how some of these things are implemented. If anyone's interesting, uh, interested, but frankly, it's very late. So I think, um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to hold people, but this is all up on, um, this code is on Beam UAV, which is, is that on there? Where is Beam UAV? It's on my final slide. I'll just put that, I'll put the final slide up of, um, there we go, Keynote. Where is Keynote? It's in there somewhere. There you go. So those are some interesting URLs for you. I'm sorry that went so long. That's, uh, that is, uh, the recording was only 30 minutes at um, Lambda Jam and it's just amazing. I do a lot of editing of my ums and things like that to make it go quickly. But um, hopefully that was interesting. And remember, it doesn't have to be flying. You could muck around with the rovers or stuff. I just want to show you other interesting domains that Elixir is actually really, really great for. And, you know, and maybe you're curious about it. Cheers.